Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today, we're going to wrap up our series entitled, Faith Revisited. This message today is part nine, four days late. There will be many times when your faith is challenged. How many of you know that when Jesus seems to be late, he seems to be four days late, your faith is challenged. We've all read the story or we've heard the testimonies that when Jesus is four days late, he's still on time and we believe it. But when it happens to us, when the ball is in our court, it feels like it's all over. Not even Jesus, not even him coming now is enough. It's too late. Four days is too late. You'll be believing God to move one way or to move this way and God will move that way and he'll move another way. And because he doesn't move the way that we've instructed him to move in our prayers, our faith is challenged. Our whole world is turned upside down. These scriptures are scriptures like Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. They're all rendered meaningless. You don't want to hear that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You want your joy and you want your joy now. And it is God who seems like he took away your joy. Therefore, it is him to blame because he doesn't love us as much as he claims to love us. Those are the times when, when darkness just seems to enclose around us and our whole world seems to be tumbling on top of us. Well, this is what happened in the scriptures we're about to read. You remember Mary and Martha whose brother Lazarus had died. Well, this is their story. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 11, verse 28 through 37. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved them? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, had sent word to Jesus asking him to please come, please come to our house because my brother, our brother Lazarus is really, really sick. He's so sick, he's at the point of death. Please come. And then they tried to throw in a little bit of coercion there to ensure that Jesus would hurry and come to them. Listen, listen to the word that they sent to Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 3. So the sister said to him, saying, Lord, he who you love is ill. But you see, Jesus would not be manipulated. 
He was solely and completely dedicated to the Father, being completely and totally led by the Holy Spirit. He only did what he heard from God the Father. So when Jesus heard the terrible news that Lazarus, his dear friend, was ill, he remained where he was two more days. Let me draw your attention back to the centurion. We covered this in one of our other messages, but I just want to draw a little bit of comparison here. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 10. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. This is just like um, Lazarus. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Surely, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. See, the centurion, he was not a Jew. He was not a follower of Jesus. He wasn't a disciple. But the centurion came to Jesus and he said, I, I really, really need a healing. My, my favorite servant is sick. I need you to heal him. And Jesus replies, okay. No problem. I'll come to your house and I'll lay my hands on him and I will heal him. Now look at the centurion's response. He says, no, no, man, that's okay. I know that you're a holy man. You're more holy than me. You are a man of God. I believe those stories that I've heard about you. I believe that they are true, that you are the son of God. And so I don't deserve for you, a holy man, the son of God, to come under my roof. I believe that all you need to do, because you have authority, uh, all you need to do is just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus marveled at that statement because of the amount of faith that was packed into that statement. And Jesus further claimed that no one in all Israel, not even his best friends, had that much faith. They wanted Jesus, Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to come to them to heal their brother. They did not understand authority like that centurion understood authority. Like I said, he was not a Jew. He was not a Christ follower. He was not a believer. He was not part of, of the 12. He was not even a part of the 70 that, that Jesus sent out. He wasn't even a part of the 120 in the upper room. But yet, he understood authority. And he understood that Jesus had authority. Mary and Martha could have requested that Jesus just speak the word wherever he was at. Just speak the word and their brother Lazarus would be healed. But their faith did not and would not stretch that far. Now mind you, they believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They believed that he was God, the Son of God. Like Carmen said in his song, they even supported his ministry. But that was too much of a stretch for them to make. I could just imagine that everyone was gathered around Lazarus' bedside, holding vigil, praying, hoping. And every now and then somebody would peep out the window, just knowing that when they peep out the window, they would see Jesus coming. 
He would come. Surely, surely Jesus would come. For this man, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They looked around and they said, the messengers who delivered the news to Jesus, they're back. Why had not Jesus come back with them? Then in the wee hours of the morning, as it always seems to happen, Lazarus slips off into eternity. Lazarus dies. He breathes his last. He gives up the spirit. And he's dead. Then in a loud, mournful, agonizing cry, Mary slips into Martha's arms and she utters, If only he had been here. If only Jesus had come, Lazarus would not have died. If he had only come, Martha. Now it's too late. Our brother Lazarus is dead. So they make funeral arrangements. His plot is already carved out in the cave. The big stone is already chiseled and shaped to cover up the opening. And everybody who will mourn Lazarus' passing is there with them. So they have Lazarus' funeral. They seal the tomb. It's over. It's done. It's finished. There's someone comes running breathlessly into the house between pants and bless him. Jesus is here. The teacher is here. Martha hears the name and gets to her feet and she goes out to meet the only man that could have saved her brother if he had not delayed, if he had not been four days late. But Mary, hearing the name, just stayed seated right where she was. She would not be fooled again. There were a lot of emotions going on inside her. There was a lot of things that needed sorting out. When Martha got to where Jesus was, the first thing she said, it was not, hello. It was not, how are you? It was not even, what kept you so long, Jesus? No, the first word that came tumbling out of her mouth was, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. There was still a ray of hope there in Martha's voice. Her, her words stated that she had not lost all all hope altogether. The grave was still so final to her though, but she, was, she could still believe that God, the Father, would give Jesus whatever it is that he asked him to give him. But he was four days late. If he had been there the day before, even two days earlier, maybe he could still raise, but he's four days late. Just maybe all was not completely lost though. But it still remains. He is four days late. So Jesus encourages her. Your brother will rise again. But not fully understanding what Jesus was saying to her, she replies to him in verse 24. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. She believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. She believed in the resurrection of the righteous, but she did not fully understand what Jesus was talking about. Though he died, yet he shall live because Lazarus has been in the tomb for so long. Jesus is four days late. 
She did not think that Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead because too much time has passed by. It's been too long. Then apparently, Jesus looked around and did not see Mary. So he asked for Mary. What does Martha do? Martha goes home and she whispers in Mary's ear. The teacher is here. He is asking for you. When Mary heard that Jesus was asking specifically for her, she quickly got up, rushed out of the house, and she went to where Jesus was. Jesus had not yet entered the village as yet. He remained where Martha had met him. Please understand that Jesus calls each and every one of us, but he does not invade our privacy. He will not come crashing into our house. Jesus will call and then he will wait. And at this time, it, it all depends on us to get up from where we sit and get up and come quickly to where Jesus is waiting for us. He has not entered the villages yet. He has not come and invaded our privacy, but he will, he will cause a miracle for us to happen if we rise, go to him where he is waiting for us. You see, sometimes we miss out on our blessing. We miss out on our opportunity. Or we miss out on our answered prayers, the answer to our prayers, because it seems like Jesus is 40 years late and it's all over. So we refuse to get up. We refuse to go where he is. We mutter to ourselves, Jesus, if you had only been here. And the scenario plays over and over and over again in our minds and in our imaginations. And it just tears a hole, many, many holes in the fabric of our faith. Paul and Silas could have concluded, Jesus, if you had only been here, Silas and I would not have been beaten to within inches of our lives. We would not be shackled in this dingy, stinking prison. But that thought did not even enter Paul and Silas's mind. But instead, in Acts chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, this is recorded. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Then the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors were open. We will miss our blessing if we have the attitude that if it's Jesus' fault because he is four days late. This is where Mary found herself. She had heard that Jesus was coming, but she stayed seated in the house where she was. She while her, her, her sister Martha went out to meet him. She went out to meet Jesus where he was. He hasn't even entered the village yet. But Mary, or sorry, Martha went to find him. Mary's faith was challenged. But yet, she quickly, when she heard the news that Jesus was calling her, she quickly got up and she went to Jesus. The Jews who were consoling her there in the house thought she was going to the tomb to grieve for Lazarus there. See, when our faith is challenged, we don't stay where we are. We don't stay remain. We don't remain seated in the house where we're at, in the place where we're stuck, in the darkness under the cloud that is trying to cover us, that dark cloud that's trying to cover us. No, we quickly get up. And we quickly run to Jesus. I want to read the conversation between Mary and, and, and Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 30 through 32 through 37. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, 
where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved them? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? See, when Mary got to Jesus, she fell at his feet in hopelessness. Martha got to Jesus. This is, there is no record of her falling at Jesus' feet. She simply stated, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then she adds this, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She wasn't in total unbelief. There was a ray of hope. She wasn't on the verge of rejecting her faith. Mary, on the other hand, had lost all hope. The sorrows of life had pressed her down. She was on the verge of walking away from her faith. Or at least, the at the very least, she was about to put Jesus on the shelf like we so often do when things don't go our way. Or when, when he do don't act the way that we expect him to act. We pick Jesus up. We put him on the shelf. And we'll be back for you in a little bit, Jesus. I just got to get over this. I just got to get over the disappointment of what you did not do for me. So... When she got to Jesus, Mary did, she repeated the same words that her sister Martha had spoken. If you had only been here, Lord, if you had only come, my brother would still be alive today. He would not be dead. But unlike Martha, Mary's words were more of an accusation than an observation. With Martha, if you remember, Jesus had Martha reconfirm her faith. But with Mary, he did not do that at all. He realized that the enemy had come in and had stole the seed that was scattered on this rocky path. And not just her alone, but the Jews that had come with her. Jesus saw that they had lost their faith. Let us revisit verse 37. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? They had lost their hope. They had no more hope that Jesus could or would even raise Jesus from the dead. Even though Jesus had proved he could do that very same thing many times in his earthly ministry. There was unbelief and doubt from some of the Jews because after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they went babbling to the, to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. While others, though, there were others who put their trust and their hope in Jesus. So when Jesus looked around and saw the unbelief, and how it affected Mary. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, this, the, the scriptures tell us. You know, Jesus would be greatly troubled in his soul two more times after this. One time when he thought about the price that he would have to pay back in John chapter 12, verse 27. Then again at the Last Supper, when he said that someone, someone right here, his close friends, one of his close friends, would betray him. John chapter 13, verse 21. This was not a small thing. This was not a, a, a small experience for Jesus. It so deeply troubled him that when he asked where they had laid Lazarus, I believe it was at this time that Mary turned around with some of the Jews and walked back to the house. When Jesus looked and saw Mary leaving, he wept. He wept for her. 
It was the Jews who said, see how he loved them? It was not the author of the book. It was not the author of the gospel, but it was the Jews who said, see how he loved them. That's why he's weeping. But obviously, Jesus was not weeping for Lazarus because he knew what he was about to do. That, that is, he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. So it had to be something, something more than weeping for a dead man who he was about to raise to life again. That just doesn't make sense. It had to be Mary. Mary, whose faith was quickly dwindling, and it did not want, and she did not want to go to the tomb with Jesus to weep there. She had had enough. Look at John chapter 11, verse 38 through 39. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Notice that it was Martha that spoke, and not Mary, and not Mary and Martha, but it was Martha alone. Let us take a look at how it is presented to us when there are two people in agreement. Acts chapter four, uh, chapter three, verse four. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. But Mary is not included in this conversation at all. I believe the reason that she is not included is because she is not there. Look at this. Look at this. Turn to, or let's go to John chapter 11, verse 45 and 46. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, not Mary and Martha, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now let's let's take a quick look and dissect this just, just a little bit. We're not going to get real deep into it, but let's just look. Many of the Jews who had come with Mary, now this word, who had, is inputted for clarity. Not that they appear in the original. It says the Jews therefore come with Mary, right? The news was brought to Mary and the Jews who went back to the house and said, Lazarus is alive. Lazarus is alive. They brought this news back there. And they all, Mary and the Jews who went back to the house with her, they came running to the tomb to see the resurrected Lazarus. And some then believed what they had saw what they saw Jesus had done. He had raised Lazarus back to life. Here's the bottom line. Things, situation, circumstances, all organized by the enemy most of the time will come to try to steal your faith. Things will sometimes not work out as you have prayed. They will not work out as you have asked. They will not work out as you have believed they would work out. But in these times, we do not turn away from our faith. We do not stay seated where we are. But instead, we get up, we dust ourselves off, and we run to Jesus. We draw closer to Jesus. In these times, we humble ourselves and we fall at the feet of Jesus as Mary did. And we, we, we anoint Jesus' feet with our most expensive offering. We wipe his feet with our hair, which is our, 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 our in, in other words, with our highest glory. What are we doing? We're building a relationship. More than that, we're building intimacy. Without intimacy, there is no closeness. There is no power. There are no miracles. We need intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the bride bridegroom. 
We are the bride. Without intimacy, there is no marriage. You don't give your best to someone you barely know. You don't give your authority to someone that doesn't have your interest. You don't give everything that, you, you, that belongs to you to someone that you cannot trust because you do not know this person. You do not give your power of attorney to an acquaintance. You only give these things to a close and trusted friend. That's why Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Jesus does not do that either. He does not give away his power, his authority to acquaintances. Jesus will not give you his full authority to drive up demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, if you do not have a close relationship with him. And how do you build that relationship? You build that relationship by spending time in prayer, spending time in Bible study, getting to know what Jesus expects of us. Spending time in devotion, spending time in meditation. You meditate continuously on Jesus and meditate upon his word. Do not think that your trials are too severe or your hardships too difficult because there is no situation, good or bad. There's nothing in all creation, no hurt, no pain, no disappointment that can beset us that can even begin to compare to what Jesus has in store for us, for us, those who love him, who adore him, who are waiting for his return. You see, when our faith is challenged, here is what we must do. We must begin to worship. We must begin to praise. We must fall on our knees and talk to Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is Jesus. Our friend, have you made him your all in all? Is Jesus your friend today? If you haven't made Jesus your all in all, you can. Just say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to believe in you. Help me to trust fully, totally, and completely in you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. I accept your free gift of salvation. And now I will live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I want you to get a Bible, get a Bible, and begin to read the Bible. Highlight the, those verses that are meaningful to you. Learn those verses. Commit them to memory. Commit them to, to, to heart. Store them away in your heart that you might not sin against them. Now, I want you to find a Bible-believing church, not a progressive church, but a Bible-believing church who believes there's a right way and a wrong way to live and that they, they, they preach the righteousness and the holiness of God, but they also preach the judgment of God. I want you to join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Thank you. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. The Lord bless you richly. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.